Hey everybody, welcome to Guitars OK. I'm your host, Mac, and uh, today I have a special guest. I have David Teagard. Welcome to the show, David. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. All right, so those of you who might know David Teagarden already because of his prior history of music with his Grammys and all the albums you've been on, your discography is huge, right, David? Well, I don't know. It's pretty big. You know what's get bigger. So uh, yeah. David was a part of some legendary albums with uh, Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, and you've been with Eric Clapton and J.J. Kale, and we'll get into some of that, but let's talk about where we're sitting right now. So where are we right now, David? We're sitting at... Uh... Um, Tea Garden Studios um, in Tulsa on Studio Row, um, just near the church studios. So church studios just down the road. And for those of you guys that have been tuning in for other episodes, we were there last year. And uh, we finally got a chance to just come down the road and catch Tea Garden Studios. So lately, I believe, like, was Seth here? Seth Lee Jones also in the studio here? Seth has got two albums here. His upcoming new album, which I, forgive me, I don't have the title of yeah. it. Yeah. But it comes out in May. It's like Custom Records or something, I think the name of it. I think that's the name of it. We'll get, we'll get you, Seth. I'll we'll put the picture it. on there. Yeah. And, uh. Actually, I, Kale and I were, he's like a big brother to me. Yeah. And always uh, called me out to, we'd stay in communication either by phone, across country, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to Tulsa because I had a studio out down in Mulgee County. Okay. And, uh, Anyway, I kept saying, you know, you need to come record. He said, yeah, I want to. And finally he did. And we did the, an album called to, to Tulsa and Back. I remember that album. And album. Uh, it was fun. I love that album. And uh, but at that time I was showing him that I found this building that I wanted to move to because I wasn't living out of that the Belt Mogi place. There was a house there that I had lived in at one time. But anyway, so I showed him this building, which had been, at that time, was a machine shop. And uh, he said, I think you ought to get that building. I said, yeah, if I can ever sell the farm, I'll buy this building. And... Uh, so when we finished up all the recording, uh, he left town, went back to San Diego area where he was living, and I'd send him mixes of the songs off the to Tulsa and back, and he'd approve them and this, that, and the other. And at the, we, at the end of the process, I said, well, I'm all done, but now, John, I have to always called him John. Um, well, that was his name. Right. Uh, <laughs> but any, so many people were used to calling him JJ. Anyway, I said, John, I've got to send you a bill for the recording and everything. He said, yeah, go ahead. He said, did you ever buy that building? I said, well, I have not been able to sell a farm to be able to buy the building. And he asked me how much the building, what they were asking for, and I told him, and I went ahead and sent the, uh, sent him a bill on the recording and stuff, and he sent me back a check for the building. Wow. Plus paid for the recording. Holy cow. So. Wow. Thanks, JJ. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. That is amazing. Now, yeah. on that album, were you obviously playing drums on that album? Were you just reproducing it? I was just more of a production. Okay. I had an engineer, but I oversaw the production. Mm -hmm. Although he apologized later that he didn't give me any credit, production credit. Oh, interesting. Okay. But uh, that was okay. I said, hey, that's okay. I got to. As long as it's check cleared, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so with that, it took several years. 
this building sat vacant for several years before we were able to do anything with it because they couldn't get they couldn't sell the farm. And the farm was in Okmulgee area. Yeah. Right? For those of you who are not from Tulsa area that watch the show, they're from other states and other countries even. How far is Okmulgee from Tulsa? About? Well, it's uh, 30 some miles. It was about a 40 minute trip. From so for those of you not from here, it's kind of cumbersome if you had maybe some people that have to come into town, yeah. go out there and record where this is more centrally located, right? Yeah. Or towards the city. We're not far from the city for those of us. I'll show a picture here. Oh, out front then, how close we are to downtown city. area. The church studio is just down the road that way. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, we, uh, it sat for a long time, and uh, I rented it out to a band. They'd come in and drink a lot of beer and play. And band stuff. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so, but it wasn't until... I don't know when it was <laughs> that we finally I sold enough property. Mm -hmm. I had almost a hundred acres wow. out there, so we were. I started, you know, selling parts of it, That's and because awesome. nobody wanted to buy a hundred acres <laughs> in Okmulgee, <laughs> in Okmulgee, and uh, but. Uh, what was the main, what was one of the first big pieces that you got for the studio that you said now we're cooking? Was it like a soundboard, console board? Was it I no mean, it was I mean, renovations? It was, it was dedicated. I mean, it was all from selling parcels mm -hmm. out at the out at the farm. We called it the farm. Right. And uh, luckily, my engineer Brett. His dad was a sweetheart. He can't. He's a contractor, and he came in and took measurements of the building, mm -hmm. so we could then draft out where we wanted to put new walls and this, that, and the other. Looks nice in here. This is my first time in here. I like Thank it so you. far. We'll see more of it after the interview, but yeah, I'll show some pictures. So were were you looking for a certain? Uh, you've been in studios, so let's back up for yeah. a second. You've been in studios. For a while now. This isn't your first go around from what right. I can tell, meeting right. you and talking to people about you and researching about you. So when yeah. was your first go around with studios? Oh man. Uh -huh. Well it was in Tulsa. Okay. And it was kind of through it was through Kale. Okay. I met him. I was probably sixteen or seventeen when I met him. He was a big star to us locals. Well, he had never had a national hit. No one knew him besides out here. And, uh, but I, I, I messed with him because he kind of had electronic knowledge enough that he was into recording. Well, he just had a little tape recorder at his house and he messed with it. In Tulsa area? Was yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so... Uh, just kind of hanging out with him. He was a real sweetheart and let me hang out. And the the rate there was a radio station here, KVOO Radio, and they had a studio. Hmm. And we'd go in there, and he'd go in there and record a song or something. And it was weird because you were. Kind of at the mercy of whoever the engineer was, right? And he knew, Kale knew a little bit more. He was a lot more savvy about recording than they were, and uh, but it was kind of strange to the engineer. He'd say, "Well, I need a, a I need a a mic on the bass drum," and they the guy'd look at him weird and say, "Why? What do you?" We all know that the bass drum, blah, 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 and the studio had been built um, so that you could just, the theory was put one microphone in there and it would to capture it all, like in a atmosphere it. kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, I, that wasn't the case. And I years later, when... Uh, I got more savvy about it, and I 
she he I went out to California mm -hmm. actually met Leon mm -hmm. had come home for a holiday visit they all knew him I was just a kid hanging out and were you still like 16 17 18? yeah and so uh, uh, so you went out to Leon's out there yeah, in California, was, who was from here originally. So these are all yeah. kind of Tulsa group people, right? Yeah. And I was into recording, mm -hmm. too, but I didn't really have the savvy. I didn't have the electronic knowledge. I knew how to plug stuff in <laughs> and uh, sometimes work the controls. But I didn't know all the theory behind the components. So but, did you get some good recordings out there for working with Leon and stuff? Or yeah, with other I, he bands invited or? me to move to his house, but mm -hmm. he missed, he meant it was a misnomer that he thought maybe it was some kind of prodigy <laughs> electronics guy. <laughs> and as soon as I got out there, I was living, he invited me to live in his house, which he had a state-of-the-art studio in the house. And uh, but he was always trying to invent stuff and get me to design it. And I was, oh, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, not for you. That's not my, <laughs> not in my brain. I don't know right. how to do all that <laughs> stuff. But he, at that time, Leon was cel kind of celebrating that he'd moved from just being a session musician to an arranger. And uh, so he had formed a partnership with a guy named Snuff Garrett, who was a Liberty Records a, a kind of, not an executive, but A&R guy, arrangement repertoire. Now that's a producer. Right. But uh, he had formed an alliance with uh, uh, this guy, and they were producing uh, Gary Lewis and the Playboys, and then had several hits. And uh, But Leon would leave in the mornings to go do the recording stuff, and Kale would show up about the same time. 10 in the morning, I'd work with Kale all day long. Oh, so you were learning under him too then, huh? Yeah. Yeah, again, kind of from here and out there, all yeah. places. Okay. So uh, it was quite a deal. And, and I had a dear friend from here that was a keyboard player mm -hmm. named Skip Nepay. And uh, he was on the road a lot. But we'd stay in communication finally uh, he kind of got off the road part and I invited him to come live at Leon's sure much to Leon's chagrin <laughs> I said I don't remember inviting Skip to live here and I said yeah yeah I'm sorry so uh, we had another friend the one that a guy named Larry Bell was a keyboard player and and uh, he moved, he was, Larry Bell was the one that introduced me to Leon. And, uh, but anyway, Larry had called and said he was coming out to live for a while. So Skip and Larry Bell and myself got a, an apartment mm -hmm. somewhere there in LA. And, uh, but, I don't know where to go with that, but the guy that, that yeah. Leon was partnering with, Snuff Garrett, mm -hmm. was kind of enamored with me and Skip. You know, Skip was kind of a character keyboard player, Hammond B3 player. Nice. And um, he said, you know, I can get you guys a record deal, just just a single. The only ah, okay, so we recorded there at Leon's uh, a song called Who Do You Love, which was a Bo Diddley mm -hmm. composition that we were inspired by 
the band, mm -hmm. and that we used to see them, and huh. they, they were just... Robbie Robertson and all yeah, that. Oh, yeah. 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 Levon. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I got to meet Le Levon. Really? Uh, it was after they had teamed up with Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. and everybody was mad at Dylan for going electric because he'd been a folk singer. Right. And he came out with the band, and everybody just booed. And what? Really? They hated That's it. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, wow. one day, a friend of ours, Jimmy Markham, mm -hmm. Junior Markham, came to the house while I was working with Kale at the at Leon's house mm -hmm. and uh had Levon with him and I was oh. <laughs> oh my god and he sat Leon yeah. or Levon sat in the living room was watching T V and then Markham left. And uh, we got finished for the day. Kale said, Well I'm done or let's let's hang it up for today and Kale left, and I walked out in the living room, and <laughs> Levon was still sitting there. I said, what happened to Markham? He said, I don't know. He just never came back. So I said, well, do you need a ride home or something? He said, yeah, I wouldn't mind it. And so I gave him a, a ride to an apartment he was staying in, and, but I did ask him, I said, aren't you out on the road with Dylan? You know, he's doing a big world tour or something. He said, no. He said, I didn't want to play with, be on stage with somebody where it was a star come out and everybody be booing him. That's crazy. And uh, <laughs> So when you were out there then, and so while you were out there then, um, meeting all these people, right? Yeah. Making contacts, learning how to do some recordings, right? Getting on some recordings, doing all that. What eventually brought you into like the Bob Seeger thing? Because I've read some stuff online, but I just want to hear from your testimony. How'd you get into the Silver Bullet band? And what was the connection between those from where you're at there to well, like, let's, touring with that? I don't know. We got seven days. Yeah. But, <laughs> got a lot, but, in a nutshell. So you kind of met somebody a, somewhere. A thing. I, I was so frustrated out in California hmm. that I couldn't play oh, because. Nice in the bars because you had to be 21 and I was maybe 17, 18 and looked like I was 14. You know, a lot of the guys that went out uh, from here got fake IDs. Right. I heard about that. Even Leon Russell did, I guess. At one I point. guess at one point. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, but I, I didn't figure I could pull that off. Because you're young looking. So. Yeah. <laughs> Which worked out good in the long run <laughs> for you. Yeah. It did. So finally, uh, I decided, or we did cut a record mm -hmm. under the guy. Then I said, what are we going to call you guys? And we, well, let's call it the Sunday Servants. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> but that was a good name. So, yeah. but anyway, so the record didn't do anything, of course. <laughs> and, uh, then uh, I decided I can't, I don't want to play. So we came home for a visit and immediately got a gig or something, you know, some mm -hmm. club and, as the Sunday servants. And <clears throat> then Skip, a buddy, got a deal to go on the road with somebody playing in uh, Nevada some of the casinos oh, cool. in there. And uh, so he took off and I stayed here for six, eight months. I mean, I was here about six, eight months. And then Skip called me and said, okay, my gig's over, I'm coming back home. And let's just do a, we were gonna do a duo. Mm -hmm. You know, him on organ, me on drums. And, but we didn't like singing. So, but we found a guy that had just moved here from Kansas okay. named Carl Day, and he was, we were, we were all into rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. like Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, Aretha Franklin, 
You know, well, anything that came out of Detroit or came out of Muscle Shoals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we hired this guy to sing, Carl Day, and we were playing a club here in town. And one night, some guy came around and was just, and he was bugging everybody at the club going moving to the table to table and they all thought he was a narc or something. all right they didn't trust him yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah i can see that, that okay that, that makes sense so we took a intermission and he did come up to talk to me he said hi i'm jim cashley and I'm from Detroit, and you guys need to come to Detroit. There's the connection. They would yeah. just go absolutely nuts. Okay. And I said, yeah, well, okay. He said, unfortunately, I'm on the road. He was on his way to California for the primary. Mm -hmm. He was working for Bobby Kennedy. Oh, okay, yeah. Wow. Well, we know what happened to Bobby Kennedy. Right. And uh, so... Jim Cashley mm -hmm. called me about a week later and he said, well, my gig's over and I'm back in Detroit and you guys need to come on. Wow, so you guys packed it up and... Well, it wasn't that easy because Skip had just moved back to his home town and was playing, we were playing every night. Yeah. And uh, it was hard like, trying to talk him into it. And the guy that had just, the singer, said no. Because he was just getting to know all the Tulsa guys and kind of getting in. Makes sense. And working, playing every night. Better is a bird in hand than two in the bush. So he was working. <laughs> yeah. So, right. Okay. So, there we were. So, I did manage to talk Skip and moving to Detroit. So, did. that's where the connection actually happened up there then, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. So then we, uh, our manager, in fact, we were starting from scratch. Yeah. He was, he wasn't, he's, he'd never been in management before. Oh so boy. But we, he was green and you guys are starting from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> so we moved, in fact, he put us up at his mom's house. <laughs> Big yeah. budget, huh? <laughs> yeah. And uh, got us introduced to some of his friends. And we finally started kind of getting into a couple of clubs here and there. Around there and kind of getting a little bit of a name for ourselves. And he, uh, Cassidy, our manager, was great coming up with ideas and do something promotional. And... Uh, I was always, I was, you know, came from wanting to record. I was more into recording than live performance. But anyway, he put out, he rented a nightclub and found a guy with a recorder who could set up in the back room of this nightclub and record their set. And he sent out a, press release to all the radio stations and print media in Detroit saying that T Garden and Van Winkle are going to record the live album that whatever, Red Carpet was the name of the club. And we'd been working on this, writing these songs for that album. And so we, the place was packed. Free beer. <laughs> that always helps. And, and uh, so we just did the album worth, you know, and we did two sets, and each set was the same. Oh, okay. So you did the same the set album. twice then. Okay. Yeah. Now that became an album, right? Because I was listening, yeah. to, I was listening to it earlier today. I liked it. it an Evening cool. at Home with mm -hmm. T. Garden and Van Winkle. And there was a guy that... Uh, was a friend of our manager who turned out was an accountant at Motown. So he kind of got us connections for 
the person coin. And he, he, we, it was suggested we take a picture. Of course, we had to have an album cover. And he found the, it was a vacant mansion somewhere there in Detroit. And, and it was a Fisher estate. You heard Body by Fisher, it was General Motors mm -hmm. deal. But it was the old Fisher mansion. And he got clearance from them for a dollar to get our pictures made. And we were out there, and, and Jim Cassidy, our manager, had kind of a theme for us. He put, had Skip wear overalls, and me kind of dressed a little more formal. And uh, I don't know. So anyway, and 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 he found an old twenty two and had Skip hold that. We were standing by a tree or something. And right after we took the pictures or did the photo shoot, we heard, put the gun down. And we looked and there were about fifteen cops that came out from around bushes and stuff around the, that house. Wow. And the, I guess a neighbor had seen us with a gun. And they had previously, a year before, I mean, before Skip and I got there, they had riots. And a uh, big riot of some kind. So everybody was kind of on edge. But after they heard Skip talk, well, how you doing? You know, he. They all started laughing about it, and they looked at the gun and <laughs> cracked up. These guys aren't doing much. Did you boys have a good day? And we'll see you later. <laughs> but anyway, the album got a ton of airplay. On there was one. There was an FM station, twenty four seven FM, that played album rock i mean rock and roll but album cuts and that's kind of one of the first in the nation that did that and they had been at the at the party where we recorded the album so we were on regular rotation wow and uh, which back then radio was king yeah and i grew up in the 70s so yeah. i grew up on the canadian border in niagara falls Oh, so I yeah. was listening to Detroit, Toronto, Philly. I was listening oh, to all yeah. that. So that was a big deal back then. It sure was. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we got a call from Atlantic Records. They wanted to sign us. Then they bought the album. They paid all our costs for that album. And we thought, well, look out. Here we go. And... Uh, we we played, you know, around like Niagara Falls and played up in Canada. Buffalo. Yeah. Cleveland, you do that whole circuit. But we mainly it seemed like we played a lot in Canada. London, Ontario, yep, and Toronto. Whatever that is. Yep. And such. And uh so I don't know, but and we play and there we played a lot of shows around Detroit too, you know, with Seeger was going local. The solo was it kind of it was a solo thing back then, right? No, he had the he had a band. Oh, okay, yeah. And Ted Nugent, and, of course, and uh, Iggy Stooge and the three psychedelic Susie. <laughs> we call it all uh, circus rock because we thought we were more, you know, into it, but. Um, uh, and they wouldn't even let us, no one would let us go over to Motown. I wanted to go see Motown. And unbeknownst to me or us at the time, Motown was moving out of town. They were right. moving to, in the process of moving it all to LA. And so, I don't know, but, uh, 
we put out our, our that first album sold 10,000 albums. We decided to do another album, or our next album, with Atco, or Atlantic Records. It sold 2,000. So, oops, <laughs> we need a hit of some kind, and Atlantic dropped us. Mm. And uh, so then we back to square one, and uh, I had a call from Leon, Leon Russell, telling me that he had formed a partnership with Denny Cordell, and that they he had produced uh, Joe Cocker, and they had put together this Joe Cocker and the Mad Dogs and Englishmen, and there were a ton of Tulsa people mm -hmm. on that show, I mean, in the band, and they, he told me they were going to come in like a couple of weeks, their first gig, first well, first two gigs was going to be in Detroit at the East Town Theater and told me where they were going to, what day they were going to get in, what time, and the hotel. He said, come on over at the hotel at that time. And, okay, so we went over there. I don't know if Skip didn't go. He had something going on. I went over there to the hotel and, and there was a promoter in Detroit, a guy named Rush Gibb. And he said, Leon asked me, he said, do you know this Rush Gibb guy? And I said, yeah, he's a promoter. And he's got a place called the Grandy Ballroom. Everybody plays there. That's anybody. And he said, well, he's coming over in a helicopter. He's got a helicopter, and they're going to land over here, and he wants to take us somewhere. You want to go with us? And I said, yeah. So me and Leon and this Russ Gibb and the pilot got in the helicopter and took off, and Russ Gibb was telling Leon, said, we've got this place. We're going to do a festival. And that was right at, that was probably six, eight months after Woodstock. Oh, right. And everybody was going to have to do a festival. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and the die had been cast. So uh, he kept asking Leon, he said, well, I want you and Joe Cocker, the Mad Dogs and Englishman, to play this festival. And Leon kept saying, well, there's no way, because our tour will be done before then. It'll cost too much to get everybody back together for just one gig. Or... Yeah, that was a big, that was a big group, too. That wasn't, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a duo or nothing. That was, no. That was a big to-do. 15 or 20 people. Amazing, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, he said, well, I'll pay you 5000 or something. I don't think about ten thousand, and we flew to the site, and they were building a big stage. We hovered around, flew around, and we showed it. It was kind of a real interesting stage they had built. It was a big circular deal with a partition down the middle, so they could set while somebody was playing, performing, they could set up the next band cool and then the stage hands had handles they could put in the, that's cool that that stage so they could turn it and uh, so then we flew back to the hotel and, and i we went i went to both nights of the mad dogs and englishmen the first gig in Detroit two nights Friday and a Saturday sold out and wow that must have been pretty cool yeah and I even got up and played tambourine or cowbell you got your foot in the door there <laughs> yeah well I knew they're all your friends anyways. a lot of the bands you know right <laughs> and uh 
So that was quite an experience, but so, so yeah, we uh, when I was telling you that Atco Records or Atlantic Records had dropped Skip and I, T. Garden and Van Winkle, from their from the their roster. We were back to square one, but with the Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Uh, Sunday morning after their Saturday performance, Skip and I were staying together, and um, that morning he he said, "Hey, I wrote this song. I've got a new song. Tell me if it's not too much like there was a song called Amen mm -hmm. that had been in Lily's a movie, Lilies of the Field." had been written by Curtis Mayfield mm -hmm. and uh, he played this song for me and he said well what do you think does it sound too much like that amen that was in the movie and I said yeah it sounds just like it except at the end of the course or whatever it changes it's got several notes that are different. I said, that'll be okay. <laughs> like I knew something. <laughs> and anyway, so we ended up recording it. We got a local band that had horn. We, we kind of like Leon's method at gospel kind of thing with horns and, you know, heavy rhythm section. So we did re record it, and uh, it got tons of airplay, and we got signed to a little local record company out of Detroit that had just signed a national distribution deal, and we got we were number three in Detroit. It was like the Supremes, Marvin Gaye, and uh, wow. And uh, and we got number one in a bunch of cities. Number well, number one here, and I think number one in somewhere, St. Louis, Kansas City, and it it got a lot of play. It's got a good sound to it. Yeah, I know the song. It's because it's, like, it's got that big sound that you're talking about. And then, of course, right away we got sued by Curtis Mayfield. Oops. And uh, I thought, uh oh. But uh, it got just, it got thrown out because of it, the thing changed at the end of the. Right. The, me chord. the melody kind of changed yeah. and the chord structures. Yeah. Right. That was, that was amen, 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 <laughs> amen. And ours went, amen, amen. Amen for God love and rock and roll. Right. So that one. It's kind of saved your saved you guys a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but at that time, a lot of shows we were playing. Um Seeger was on those shows. Oh, interesting. And he would be the headliner. So he never heard us. But then when we had God Love and Rock and Roll and it was getting rated, you know, number one in a lot of cities, he's he opened for us. Oh, that's funny. And so then he stayed hung around to hear what we were about. And then he really liked us and we traded phone numbers and he started coming over to our house. We had a house where we had the organ and drums set up. He'd bring a guitar over and, and <laughs> yeah. we jam. And finally he said he kept saying, Well, he couldn't uh oh, I don't want to quote him, but he was not so happy with the band he had going. He had different and, ideas and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Go in a different direction. We liked him because he had that, that 
rhythm and blues voice. Oh yeah, raspy kind of soulful. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so we joined that tour for a while. He was playing guitar, and we played gigs that our manager had booked. And then we played gigs at his man. Oh, so it was like a collaboration then. Yeah. Just, okay. And, uh, of course, he was just playing guitar and singing. But he said he came to, or we kind of had a meeting one day, and he said, I don't want to be the guitar player. We need a dedicated guitarist. And we had a buddy from here that had just gotten off the road that, played for oh, a year or so with Bobby the Blue Blend. And he was an old buddy of mine and I said, Talk, I said let's hire him. He's great. Mike Bruce. So we did and and it was God, it was a great band. We had so much fun. That was right. Then when uh, Mike Bruce mm -hmm. joined us as a guitar player, yeah. the guitar player, um, we played a lot of gigs yeah. and just were loving it and decided to uh, that we needed to record that. And uh, so we went in the studio and started recording. That was um, smoking OPs, and uh, which raised a lot of issues with our record company. And, <laughs> yeah, sign of the times. They, yeah, yeah, they were mad because they didn't get in on it, and it turned out to be on Capitol or not Capitol Records, but whatever, whatever uh, Bob was hooked up with. And uh, so we had to split sheets at that time. Seeger went on, but I told Seeger, I said, you know, I'd, I'd seen a, a special on CBS, had a documentary. It was on the time slot where 60 Minutes now is, but they did a, a, an hour kind of a documentary on two singers. One was Aretha Franklin and the other one was kind of some white girl <laughs> that was going to be possibly a big star. But they showed Aretha and we were just nuts over Aretha Franklin. And uh, they showed that she had gone to Muscle Shoals, and which now that whole story was much different than it was explained at that time. But it gave me a real desire to go to Muscle Shoals and meet those guys, which took years before that happened. But I recommend, I told, I told Seeger when we were splitting up after we had got uh, smoking OP. I said, there's some guys from Tulsa, a guy, a drummer named Jamie Oldacre, and a, a keyboard player that patterns himself after Skip. He's got the same setup, plays bass pedals, and plays B3 organ. You need to hire them. I gave him their number and he hired him. And uh, I don't know what they became, but I know they talked Seeger into doing an album called Back in 72. And they talked him into coming here and recording out at uh, Paradise Studio, which Leon had built that thing. Right. And, uh, but at the same time, then they ended up, those guys went with Clapton. The Tulsa Sound. Yeah. Back then, right? <laughs> that was the bass player, Carl Radle. 
that got that going. Oh, Miss Carl. But anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that. So eventually then you guys were out making the albums for Silver Bullet Band and everything. Did you get down to Muscle Shoals? Well, it wasn't actually? called Silver Bullet. Oh, it was just Bob Seger. Right? Just Bob, Bob Seger. Seger correct. And the system or something. Oh, okay. And yeah. then after Dick and Jamie left them and moved back here to town when Leon moved here and bought the church and did all that. Um, but then they end up, Dick and Jamie ended up going with Eric. As we all know. Yeah. <laughs> As we all know. And uh, really did well. Yeah. But I don't know where I'm going with that, but it was quite, it was such an evolution ongoing all the time. I find that interesting because it's not just an isolated incident, you know, so much of it has to like a domino effect, a rubbing effect, right? Where yeah. Does. So when you ended up doing those recordings in the 70s for the Silver Bullet Band, where did you do a lot of those recordings? Well, I was trying to get to that was yeah. an interesting story because when Dick and Jamie left Seeger and moved here to hook up with Leon, um, that's when he started the silver, when Bob started the silver bullet band. Okay. And you had alto and, you know, bass player, Chris Campbell and Drew Abbott, the guitar player, and that whole thing. Where was I going with that? But, oh, I had told Bob, I said, you know, if you can get your manager to go for it, you need to go to Muscle Shoals. Because I was completely astounded, you know, when when that thing came out, that documentary about um, uh, Aretha going to, we, I was blown away. You those gotta are, get there. <laughs> those are white guys playing so soulful. And Something's down there, right? That's just amazing. Well, he did go to Muscle Shells. And and I don't know what the first hits that came up, but from then on, every album he cut long into when I was finally went with him, um, he always cut three or four of them there. Really? Okay. Muscle Shells. Interesting. So, um, but anyway, so he had the Silver Bullet Band and they had, they had a song called Night Moves, or he had a song called Night Moves, and that just launched him. And so in the middle of that tour, they had taken a break mm -hmm. from the Night Moves tour. And so they got back before they got back out on the road, they'd always, you know, he'd do a rehearsal. They did rehearsal over in Ann Arbor and and the drummer was on his way home from the rehearsal and his car ran out of gas on the freeway and he went up to cross the service road to the gas station, get some gas in the gas can and got hit by a car. Oh my goodness. And and uh, paralyzed him from the waist down. Wow. So he was out and uh, unbeknownst, it was just incredible to me. Uh, Dick and Jamie were on the road, had been on the road with, uh, with Eric mm -hmm. and they were on a break. And uh, like a month or two month long break. And I happened to go over to one of their houses here in Tulsa. And Jamie came walking in and he said, well, I just got a call from Cedar. I said, what? He, he told me what happened to the drummer. They said, I'm just gonna go out and fill in. Oh, well, why didn't he call me? <laughs> soon they forget so 
Anyway, Jamie went out. I thought, well, Seeger's looking even hotter than than uh, Clapton. He'd be wise to stay with Seeger. At uh, anyway, so that went on for a while, and Seeger was booked in to Tulsa, and he called me. He said, "Oh, come over." got to come over and I said well I'm playing but Mike Bruce and I can come go hang out in the dressing room with you before we go to work where did they play back then what was the like what the big venue back then it seemed like it was at the fairgrounds okay and uh, so Mike Bruce and I went and the Cedar you know oh how you doing well, yeah. and he said well uh Jamie's going to go back with Eric after, in a couple of weeks. So we thought maybe he'd come up and audition. <laughs> and uh, Mike Bruce said, audition? Are you nuts? We were already in the band. We were already in the band. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I don't know, but he gave me some tapes of the show and and then a couple of weeks later, he said, well, come on up. So I went up and auditioned. But I, I got what his deal was. He was just trying to be diplomatic within the group. Right. I see what you're saying. Not forcing a hand. He yeah. Was, yeah. So anyway, I got the gig. <laughs> long, that lasted for a while then, huh? Yeah. It was 77 to 80, 81. Wow. And, uh, but what was weird was that all just went great. And I couldn't believe it. It was wonderful. And I'd finally arrived. And gotcha. Now, did you, you were in Europe, you said, at that point? Yeah. You know, yeah. So then you came back then, obviously. Did you land back here in T-Town? Yeah. Come back to T-Town and just, what'd you do then? You just started digging in all through T-Town and this area? Yeah. I yeah. Pretty much immediate gig with a guy named Bill Davis. It was a singer. It was an incredible singer. And, uh, but he didn't have any desire to get out and do anything. Everything was local. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he worked. Right. You know, I'd work, we'd work six nights a week. And, uh, so I could mess with my uh, putting together a studio in my hand. That's what I was wondering. I was going to ask you. You probably still were dabbling in like your oh, recordings. Yeah. Okay, so this is what in the eighties then, right? Yeah. So in the eighties, MTV was coming on. Yeah. Radio was fighting against it. I grew up in that whole era, yeah. so I was, I was, I was the MTV generation. So, yeah. but we were, you know, a lot of us were still listening to radio. We we're still buying cassette tapes and records too. Yeah. And uh, then the MTV thing just added to it for a lot of us. And for us, a lot of us, it didn't ruin buying stuff because I still wanted my cassette tapes, you know, yeah. my albums. You wanted your music. Yeah, and when albums meant something, the, the covers oh, yeah. had a reason there, there, and you open them up and you read the liners and who mm -hmm. played bass. And right. I find that nowadays with the stream, and I sound like an old man, but... With the streaming nowadays, they don't tell you who's on each song, no. and that's right. You know, when you go through all these kind of rock bands and jazz bands, you start seeing like the drummers that played and oh, the yeah. Carl Radels and where they were, and you could track all that. And yeah, you know, I always thought that was interesting. And now they're making a comeback to records. Yeah. So let me ask you. Let's 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 ask about this: the recording situation, like there in the eighties, and you were dabbling. Compared to now with your studio, yeah. What's the what do you think is one of the main differences between recording something like back in the eighties and now? Well, I would say there's no difference. Oh, interesting. In that prospect, but uh, just trying to figure out how to get the recordings played and get them out in front of everybody. That's a very good point. So studio recording, knowing how to mic things. Yeah, there's uh, plugins and all that now, whatever, for effects. But as far as actually getting a good sound, right? Having a yeah. producer that knows how to 
mix and well, right? that's all very similar right so yeah. you bring up a good point yeah getting the music out now is different and i said something earlier that radio was king when i yeah. grew up and then mtv became like yeah king right and, and then they the had to invest in hundreds of thousands into uh a video videos <laughs> It's amazing, yeah. yeah. But now, as we're in the, sitting here in the 2000 era, now um, you bring up a very good point. So, recording here, you capturing the sound, you're making it sound good for an artist, right? Yeah. So it's not really on you though here at the studio to get it out, right? Am yeah. I correct? That's how that's for the artist to figure out. Right? Yeah. So your job here is just to capture the moment. capture the sound, capture the moment, right? And also. You know, we went from analog tape to now computer. Digital, right? Digital. Mm -hmm. And Dale and I used to have discussions. I'd say, hey, uh, Dale, uh, it's just Mitsubishi or somebody was one of the first ones to come out with the digital tape machines. And um, Nashville jumped on that and everybody got digital tape machines. Interesting, yeah. And of course, you couldn't afford one, it was a hundred grand at least. And uh, I remember talking to Kale and he said, God, we got to get one. And then somebody came out with ADAT, came out with a digital recorder, multi-track, I think it was eight-track recorder. I remember calling Kale and said, hey, that's come out. We got one. I had five or six of them. You know, you could link them together and you'd have 16 or 24 tracks. And it would all sound pretty decent because the same levels and everything. Cause yeah, digital, it sounded great. The digital, yeah, right. So, so you had to, you've seen, that's something I want to interject here. You've seen, like I did growing up, all the reel to reels and tapes yeah. and everything and tape echoes and blah, 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 right? And all yeah. the compressors and you name it going through. And then you get into the, now the digital era. And there is still people that want to now, a small portion that want to hear, want to try recording on cassette, you know, real to real. It's too too expensive, they say now, to get all that equipment. Well, it's it, a nightmare. It's hard, hard to get it working. Maintenance, Ma nightmare. Yes. Yeah, where do you get all the replacement parts if something breaks, and right? It's That's not... that Tom Petty got signed to Shelter. Oh. And they, they had recorded maybe in Muscle Shoals or somewhere. I think so, yeah. And so Danny Cordell signed him to Shelter Records and said they had done their basic tracks and then they came here, said come here and finish the album. And they came here and the machine broke down. And so you couldn't just run the radio shack and get apart. So they were here for about a week and then Denny said, now go on to L.A. and finish it. Right. And that's a big thing now. So if something does break in some of these areas, you know, you know, like you've got now the digital stuff, you can replace them real fast. You can, you know, update things pretty quick. Yeah. And keep the ball rolling because yeah. time is money. Yeah. Right. And so what's an average time for like for bands nowadays to make an album? Oh, my God. There's no way. There's uh -huh. no way average time because... Some people just can't stop, you know, fixing. Well, I don't want to replace that guitar solo, or you know, it's it sounded kind of flat on the end of that chorus. Or so they keep going, they keep. <laughs> and is it easier to overdub now with digital, right? Isn't it? Easier? Yeah, it it is. You still got to set the mic up and do all that, and then edit. Editing's amazing, and Brett's. Great, great, but um, so it depends on the band still, and that's the same as years ago because Steely Dan, you still ago. the same in, in aspects that you know they may work on it for 
ever changing this word or changing that word or changing the lick or <laughs> you know doing something are there still guys that do like kind of one take two take kind of things where they just go for a live sound and you get those guys once well everybody while? wants to get that live sound of course i think it's cool you know yeah but... and the thought is yeah should be the way it's done but it's not <laughs> And I know, Gail, we used to talk about how crazy, because I know I'd go in and maybe work on something with him. I'd play maybe play drums on it and watch him work on it, and he'd put 50, 60 guitar solos oh, okay. or, you know, right. rhythm parts or something. And then I'd listen to the final thing. I'd say, what happened to, well, what happened to all that? <laughs> No, I didn't know. So finally, he came up with the philosophy: don't change it all the time. Save your changes for the next song you do. Good idea. You know, it sounds good and makes sense, but you can't tell somebody that that's not gone through that experience. That's true. And, that's true, and you bring a lot of experience to the table. So with you and yeah. your fellow here, and how many are you guys? Just two of you guys in the studio, then working. I don't even go in there. <laughs> you can go in there. He's in there now as we're recording. So. Yeah, I make sure the coffee's ready and <laughs> pay the light bill. And... <laughs> make sure everything looks good, right? Yeah, <laughs> the doors are open, right? The wife comes in and <laughs> arranges everything, and whatever. So you get like so. Let's as we're finishing up here. Let's talk about some of the music that comes through here. What type of music have you been getting the last couple of years? What type of genres and stuff? All kinds. Jazz, blues, folk, funk. You getting any like kind of funky R and B type stuff? Well, not. So and... most of your music's organic, not techno. So yours yeah. is more organic instruments and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, you got good vocals and instruments and guitars and. Yeah. Well, I used to put that together, but mm -hmm. I didn't like doing it because sometimes I still weren't happy with it. You know, what can you do? So who's, I saw, I'm a big fan of a guy named Tommy Crook Oh, in yeah. town. I used to go to Lana Thai. I had a Tommy watch. Crook album. Right. I saw that was on your credentials and I thought that was interesting. Um you want to talk about that for a second before we wrap up? Like, how was that working with Tommy? Was it Well, it was great because he was, well, the first sessions I did out of my farm. Oh, okay. Was Tommy Crook. Interesting. And, uh, of course, he had a bass string yeah. on his guitar, and he'd play the guitar parts and the, and the bass parts. And uh, so I recorded it. And then uh, I had him, we had him put on cassette for so it's an, I bring that up for a reason that ever since I've been in Tulsa 20 something years now, it never ceases to amaze me the depth of the music scene here. Yeah. Back in the 70s and even now, right, with all your son and all these bands around here yeah. that are really putting out some good music. Seth's new album, I can't wait for. Paul Benjamin just released a new one. Yeah. I mean, the list goes on, right, oh, all yeah. the people around here. So I want to say thanks on behalf of being a visitor to Tulsa <laughs> and living here now. Well, thank that you. you, people like your Kyle Rado, all these guys back in the day really did do a lot for the town and, and you're still doing a lot for the town. Well, hopefully. So I appreciate it. So I'm making coffee. <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on that note, we'll end the show. So thanks, David, for coming out and making coffee and giving us a good interview. I appreciate Thank it, buddy. <laughs>